What is good YouTube? So from popular demand, I'm finally doing a green tree python video. This is not going to be a how to video, but it is going to discuss how I keep green tree pythons, how I bred green tree pythons and how I incubated and hatched the vast majority of the clutch. So you could take some information from this video, but definitely uh, seek out if you're going to plan to breed green tree pythons, definitely seek out more seasoned breeders, people that have been breeding for many years because there's a wealth of knowledge out there and although I successfully bred them, I could have had complete beginner's luck. So I'm not gonna rewrite the book or anything, but it's good to put information out there and share information. The more people that do it, the more knowledge we gain in the whole community and it kind of props each other up. There's been some amazing people help me in this journey, uh, giving me uh, tips and help. There's Malcolm Dix in the UK. There's Patrick Holmes in the States. There's Marshall Mendes in the States as well. So they're three guys I've called upon for a little bit of help and advice along the way, particularly Patrick Holmes. I have a lot to thank them guys for and the good thing about the Green Tree Python community or Chondro Python, you're going to hear me reference both names in this video. Chondro is typically what older school breeders and keepers call them because they used to be Chondro in their scientific name, but it was renamed after a while. So everyone was kind of programmed to say Chondro or Chondro Python. So Green Tree Python, Chondro Python, same thing. <clears throat> so I started keeping Green Tree Pythons in approximately 2010 or 2011. I can't quite find the date to nail that date down, but it was somewhere within the crossover of 2010 into 2011. So I've been keeping them for over 10 years, but after several years of keeping them, and I did successfully breed a pair before, but I didn't successfully incubate the eggs. And that was because I didn't actually believe the female was gravid. When she laid, it was a complete surprise clutch. So I actually thought the breeding hadn't taken and it was done. So I basically separated them and went about just maintaining them for the next season. So when that female laid eggs and I acquired these two green tree pythons from Keith Goody in the UK. Sorry, I'll just turn my phone on silent. So when the eggs came, I wasn't ready. My incubator wasn't prepared and I messed up incubation. The loss was really bad and I was absolutely gutting. But sometimes if you learn from your losses, they aren't a true loss. They can be in some respects of win. So I took a lot of information from that and I took some hard lessons and it's lessons I've learned and haven't repeated, thankfully. But unfortunately, a year or so later, depression was kicking my butt and I ended up selling the whole of my Green Tree Brighton collection. Some I really regret, but I had to do it at the time. Fast forward a couple of years and a friend of mine, Dan McNiff, was selling his green tree pythons because he was moving out of keeping green tree pythons. So I went in and as Dan rightly admitted, there wasn't quite the size they should have been for their age. So I said, look, I'll take them. And ever since then, almost have been hanging on the walls, as you've seen in all these videos. Now, one of the reasons I wanted them to always be in camera view is so you guys could see on every single video, not only was they kept clean and correctly, but also there was no major issues. The snakes wasn't being rotated out. Like one month, it's a very green, green tree python. A couple of months later, it's a very high yellow green tree python. So you guys know I've had these particular four in them cages since them cages was put on the wall. Now, just to talk a little bit about how I keep them, these are Ikea cabinets. The reason I put them in Ikea cabinets is a lady once walked into my shop and she goes, well, it's okay for you. You can just walk into the shop and take an enclosure and you don't have to pay for it. Like all my suppliers give me a free of charge. So I said to her, right, I'll set myself a challenge. I will get an enclosure from a different reptile shop and pay all full price. She said, no, because you probably know the shop owners. Do it completely away from the reptile shop. I was like, oh, okay then. So I was thinking, where can I go? And I thought, Ikea. It, Ikea isn't a shop that I buy furniture from, but I just thought they have just all sorts of summer, all sorts of cabinets and in, not enclosures, but you know what I mean, boxes. So I thought in there, I'll be able to find something. So I went there, hand on heart, I walked in and there was them, but white. And I thought, that's it, they will do. So I went round the store and finally found the place they was allocated in, because this, this was a display. And I thought, perfect, and black looks really good. The downside to them are the cabinets are really cheap and flimsy, but they've lasted three years and the cabinets wasn't very expensive. So I could 
rotate them out every two or three years and, and that would make them a viable option but they've done absolutely fine i do wish there was a little bit bigger i don't think they're the ideal size for adult green tree pythons or conjure pythons so we'll see but um yeah they've done really well so they're in ikea cabinets with ikea glass door with ikea hinges and ikea lights every part of that enclosure is ikea the snakes wasn't from ikea and the decor wasn't from ikea so I keep them at room temperature. The room temperature is, it fluctuates from about 79 to 82. I do, I would have it slightly cooler in here if it wasn't for the green tree pythons. I would, I would run it constantly about 79 because it's a little bit cooler and nicer to work in. And it's fine for the lower part of the temperatures for the ball pythons because all my ball pythons has hotspots of 90 Fahrenheit. So I would run the room a bit cooler, but for their sake, I run it about 82 because that seems to be kind of one of the golden numbers that people believe they do fine and ever since then they've done fantastically well now i would i would strongly recommend you didn't try this if you kept them in a living room or a bedroom or something like this this is a dedicated reptile room it's not attached to my house it's approximately 100 foot away from my house and it was built for snakes this room is like a giant enclosure in, in many respects so please take that information as the first part this room is dedicated and specifically designed for snakes with them and ball pythons in mind so that works in this particular room now if you wasn't going to do that or if you couldn't do that i would strongly recommend the lowest temperature in the incubator uh, sorry not incubator in the enclosure around 80 maybe 79 and then the warmest are 85 so then they can firm or regulate but some evidence shows that you find a lot of green tree pythons perching directly under the heat source if it's like a reptile radiator or a reptile what, what's the other name uh, i can't quite remember but the reptile radiators or reptile heat panels and evidence have shown that the reason they perch under that is because they like to feel a little bit like enclosed so they like almost like a leaf in nature so a breeder actually basically put a false panel in so his heat source was flat and then he found his snake thermoregulated more my snakes don't thermoregulate that much because there isn't that much gradient and it's something that's really played on my mind but because nothing negative has happened they haven't got our eyes they haven't been poorly they eat every time i offer them food unless they're absolutely deep in shed but even then they still eat they have done phenomenally well so if it's not broke i'm not going to break it i'm not going to change anything it's some of that plays on my mind because when i extend urban constrictors and build my arboreal room i'm almost a little bit worried on changing their enclosures i feel they would be better to leave put and then just put my new arboreal snakes in that room but only time will tell so that's how i keep them and that's how i kept them during all aspects of their life with me and breeding nothing changed i didn't give the female more heat people were saying have you supplied the female with more heat and i was like i bumped the room temperature up a little bit i kind of hadn't kind of hadn't i felt i had to say that so alarm bells didn't ring in their head i didn't want to worry them because they worry for the snake but for some reason i thought the snakes have done so well as they are i don't want to change anything i'm risking and if she laid me slugs, then that's data to move forward with. As, it's, as it happens, she laid me 17 eggs and no slugs. So a real success in my second ever pairing. No slugs, female, did fantastically well. Now there's two observations. I'm gonna tell you when and how I, you know, when I paired them, the dates and stuff, this is what the little piece of paper is in my hand. So there's two observations I took what was out of character for the female. In the final stages of her being gravid, and gravid means she's full of eggs, um, she stared at the light and nodded her head. She would look up at her and just do this. And I thought, she's not right. That's very peculiar behavior. And it really concerned me. I thought she would maybe go on to lay loads of slugs and then get an RI and maybe die or something. You know, I was very concerned and she would do it. I was calling it stargazing, but she was looking up constantly just like that and doing this all the time and I thought oh god that doesn't doesn't look good and then she went on to lay the eggs I thought here we go I made this real crude uh, laying box I had a little peek I saw white pearly whites and I thought well at least there's some eggs in there and obviously when I took the eggs there were 17 eggs and no slugs so I was really happy 
after she laid, she still did that stargazing and it really concerned me. But after she laid, I give her enclosure a huge clean using a lot of Dettol disinfectant, the same pink stuff you see right there. And I took it back to as clean as I possibly could. I bathed her. I spent a little bit of time, you know, just checking all the eggs was out of her, making sure she was all right. Put her back in, make sure she had lots of clean water. Humidity was nice in there. And she went on to feed and she has done fantastically well ever since. And we are going to take a closer look at her soon. So both dad and mum did fantastically well. Mum is just smashed food. I fed her a little bit heavier to pull that weight on. Now where babies, are only about 15 days old maybe, approximately 15 days old, and we're gonna see how good she looks during this video. So she has really bounced back. So to talk a little bit about the breeding. So on the 3rd of November, 2021, I paired them, and that evening they locked. When I first put them in, the male went to a low branch and basically didn't even absorb, uh, look at the female, she just didn't look at her, didn't acknowledge her in any way, and I thought, oh, that doesn't look great. But by that evening they was locked, I couldn't believe it. They stayed locked for approximately three days. Three solid days, unless they had breaks during basically the time I was asleep. They was locked every time and every minute I was in this room. I was like, this boy put some work in. So they stayed locked. And then during, from, that, from that point to about the 15th of December, I would, keep, I, I would keep him in constantly. I would take him out to offer food and then if she didn't feed, put him back in. So uh, basically for about 40 days he was in there solid. Then around about the 14th or 15th of November, uh, December, sorry, I took him out and she did actually have a small meal. I thought, oh well, at least she's got some uh, nutrients and some calories in there. And then on the 20th of December, to my absolute surprise, bang, she overlaid. I was like, wow, that happened quick, maybe too quick. It did concern me. And by the 25th of February, bang, we had 17 good eggs and no slugs on the ground. Amazing. Now, when, when I um, took the eggs, I candled them and I found one egg had very weak veins. Now I've hatched many ball python eggs with very weak veins and they've hatched absolutely fine. So I thought it would hatch, it'll be okay. I will admit confidence was high. The female had you know, done what she was set out to do. Everything was fine, <clears throat> both. <clears throat> Both Sire and Dam bounced back fantastically. Confidence were high and I started to think, do you know what, this could be beginner's luck, but you watch, I might even hatch the majority of the green tree python eggs. One thing to note is it's very, very common to lose green tree python eggs during incubation, to hatch babies and they perish, etc., etc. These are not ball pythons and corn snakes and snakes like that, that are extremely easy to kind of, you know, breed and hatch babies from. So. Although I was prepared to lose babies, confidence was high and I started to think, you watch, you know, I might get 15. Shortly into incubation, one, the, the one egg with weak veins perished. Now, after about approximately 10 to 15 days, I could see the eggs was taking on too much uh, moisture. So the way I incubate them, I put 300 grams of vermiculite in an airtight container. I put the same amount of water, minus 10%, can't do the maths while I'm doing a video, it's simple maths, but it takes 30 off, 270. It was about 250 to 270 grams of water. So the vermiculite, there was more vermiculite by weight than water. I shaved 10% off the water and I put the eggs in the uh, vermiculite, as you can see. So after approximately 15 days, the eggs was starting to swell and I thought they're taking on too much water. So I quickly, one started to go like furry. I quickly moved them onto some egg crate. I moved them onto the egg crate and after then they basically shed a little bit of water and just kind of almost shrunk in a little bit, just by a millimeter or two. You could just see from, like a, a very blown up balloon to just a balloon with a little bit less air, a little bit more relaxed, I thought, that's good. So during incubation, incubation was 50 days, I lost a total of four eggs. The first one was the one with weak veins, one shortly after because of the air, because of the moisture, it went furry, it died. One about approximately two weeks before uh, incubation, uh, before incubation had ended. So approximately, let's say about day, 38, day 40, something like that. No, day 36. And I thought, you know, here we go. You know, they're all just gonna start to fall. And then one right before they hatched. 
And then on morning of day 59, I was super excited. I got up a little bit early. I came straight to the snake room like I do every morning, but I was straight out, flip flops on straight to the snake room, opened the tub and I just knew I was gonna see it. And boom, there was a baby green cheese bag then with its head out and I thought, yes, I've done it. Let's hope there's more of them. So I end up with some. The more babies you hatch, the more likely you're gonna have some to show. If I hatch one baby and that one baby was gonna perish, I was gonna end up with nothing. So I was really praying that the rest, the 13 I think it is, the 13 remaining would do fine. So I don't want this video to go on for too long, so I'm gonna try and speed up a little bit. But basically, I started with 17 eggs. I ended up with 13 when it was time to hatch and three of them 13 didn't go on. So basically one baby was completely kinked from the tip of the tail to the neck. It was unbelievable. It was just like this all the way down. A yellow baby had the umbilicus wrapped around its head and every time it pushed forward, the umbilicus would tight, tighten and I thought, that'll probably get itself free so I'm gonna leave it for a couple of hours. About six hours later, it hadn't. So I had to get in there and if you've ever seen a green tree python the eggs, they are tiny, they're not like ball python the eggs, they are absolutely tiny. And I was trying to get in there and you know untangle it without disturbing it. And a lot of pressure and stress was put on the baby and unfortunately about approximately 16 hours, the baby exited the egg. It remained very weak for eight hours and then unfortunately passed away. And then another red baby, and then there was a red baby that was in the egg, perfectly formed on day 50, and it was dead in the egg before it had a chance to pip. So once the red baby had pipped, I pipped every single egg. I didn't wait a moment. I grabbed my scissors. They're always disinfected after every single time I cut eggs. So they were ready to rock and roll, and I just cut a V, a small V, in every single egg, giving the baby an opportunity to be able to get out of the egg without too much um, too much effort. So I had a little peek in there and I could see all the different colors. So I, obviously I hatched the red ones, I hatched the super dark ones, and I hatched the yellow ones. The dark ones were what I was after. And I'm so blessed to have hatched some amazingly dark ones. We are gonna take a look at them in a moment. So from that point on, I hatched the 10 babies and all but two up to now have had their first shed and one has fed, only one. So this is where Malcolm Dix has come in and helped me um, with a lot of advice and pointers. We spent two hours and 20 minutes on the phone the other day and it's the very first conversation we've ever had. I've ne we've never met face to face. We've never had a phone call prior to that. And we spent two hours and 20 minutes. It was just two real green tree python lovers and reptile enthusiasts on the phone just talking snakes and it was absolutely fantastic. So thank you Malcolm for that. So I'm gonna now show you, I hope I will have missed certain parts, but doing all this off the top of your head, it's very difficult. And there is a pressure when you're standing in front of a camera doing a YouTube video. You know, I'm very, you know, I, I'm my own worst critic and I, I pull my videos apart all the time. So if I've missed anything, and you wanna check anything and the video is not six months old, please put it in the comment section below and I'll do my utmost best to answer each and every question. But um, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the babies and then I'm gonna we're gonna take a look at the father. Now, the only reason I'm not gonna put my hands on the mum is she's been through enough. So I'm not gonna stress her out. I'm gonna show you her, she's gonna get filmed, but I'm just not gonna get her out. I'm gonna handle the baby, look at the babies first and then we're gonna look at the adults. Right guys, so here is the first baby chondro, green tree python, a neonate. So this is UC2201 and what that means is the breeder is Urban Constrictors, the year was 2022 and this is number one baby from that particular clutch or that particular year. So this is the pick of the bunch, my absolute favourite and because typically green tree python breeders and keepers give their snakes quite out their names. I've decided to name this one. I haven't named any of the others, so if you do have any ideas, shoot them in the comment section below. But this one's called Demon Boy. And I know there's a very world famous American bully called Demon Boy. Not only have I met Demon Boy in person, but I've been to William's house uh, because I was gonna buy one of his puppies, but it, I didn't end up going through with it in the end. Anyway, I really love the name, and I thought it will be a fitting name for a very dark, almost like, melanistic green tree python that's the dream i i have no idea how this is going to turn out this baby could be just a bright green adult when it once it has its ontogenic color change i'm really really bad at uh, saying that but at the moment he's very dark and he he or she 
suits the name. Now, just to tell you a little bit about the temperatures, I'm sorry if the focus is dropping in and out, but I've had to use a permanent focus and you can see how small they are when you compare it to my thumb. But um, I'm hoping that's in focus. So, just to talk a little bit about the temperatures I'm running, I'm currently running the hot spot and when I say hotspot, it's just the hot side of the enclosure. So the enclosures that you saw on the intro is what are what I'm keeping them in. And the plastic panel that touches the heat cable is 89 Fahrenheit. And the other side is about 80, stroke 81 Fahrenheit. But inside the enclosures, this perch, what's near the heat, is about it's about 88 Fahrenheit and then this perch is about 81 so this is oh and the reason I actually bumped the temperature up more than I normally would is I found all the babies was constantly at the front you can see where this one's decided to um, hang out but um, I, I found them all hugging the heat so anyway this is Demon Boy and this is UC2201. Now I'm not going to name any others because obviously I haven't thought of the names and I'm not going to give you their codes because it's going to be 01, 02, or 03, or 04, so there's no real point. But this is baby number two that I'm going to show off. I'm going to show you all 10 today. So I'm hoping some of these babies end up being, you know, pretty spectacular as adults, but there's no way of telling. And that's the real reason I decided to keep every single baby. I want to watch them all go through their colour change and with them having biac in their blood, biacs typically uh, take quite some time to actually go through their colour change. So some green tree python localities will change in a matter of days and then others will take months and even into years. Now having said that, some green tree pythons don't really finish changing until they're about 10 years old. People believe once they're 10, they're pretty much done changing and they're not going to change anymore. But what I mean by that as well is it, within a couple of years, you're going to know how the baby is going to look and turn out. But that that baby, as it obviously ventures into adulthood, might change just a scale or two in year four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten. So it's not like you're going to see a dramatic change from year eight to year ten, but they do change a little bit. So. People may agree or disagree with that, but that's the way I see it and that's the way I take it. So there's baby number two. And here is baby number three. Really, really beautiful, pretty, really dark brown. Uh, the others would, was a bit dark. I'm just gonna try and, try and tap its head without disturbing it too much. I want you to see its beautiful face. Just incredible. It's my absolute pleasure to own these and it's gonna be my absolute pleasure to watch them grow up. So there's baby number three. So here is baby number four. As I've said guys, I've had to use a really, really uh, sharp focus point and I'm having to keep them super close. It's about eight centimeters away from the lens. So this is a little bit tricky to film, but because they are so incredibly tiny, if, you know, if I have them back here, what would be easy to film, but you're not gonna be able to see how they look and their beautiful pattern. I forgot to turn the fan off. I'll go do that now. So there's baby number four, really pretty. Love that little white banding around its uh, nose. And here is baby number five. Just beautiful. I absolutely do not get bored at looking at these. It, I know I've said it, but it really is my absolute pleasure to own these. I feel so, so blessed to be in a position to hold them back, to not only hatch them and have a successful breeding, but to hold them all back. You know, one day I will let some go, but I just want to watch them go through their colour change and learn how my sort of green tree python project is going to develop. And what I mean by that is watch them go through their colour change, see which turn out very, you know, maybe basic green, which ones turn out, you know, a little bit funky. And, you know, if, if you know, my stars align and everything comes in, maybe one, one or two might turn out, you know, dream come true snakes you never know with conjurers you really don't because there's so many there's so much different blood in captive bred ones now you, you know you can have some quite impressive uh, babies come from um, non super impressive adults and I love my adults anyway so it's going to be nice to to watch them change 
So here is number six. Again, really dark, really sort of brown. Not, not the bright red, which is obviously a blessing. The bright red ones are stunning, beautiful babies, but the, the, the darker and more almost muddy the baby looks, sometimes the more impressive it turns out. More times than not, I would, I would imagine. I'm not gonna say I know that for a fact, but I would imagine. So this is the last red one that has gone through its first shed. So the next two reds I uh, haven't had, had their first shed, but I still want to show you them. And I would love it if you'd let me know which ones you like best. So this is baby number six. And here is baby number seven. Not gone through its first shed yet. Super dark. Can't wait to see how it looks once it sheds. It's going to be quite a dark one looking at this and then a little bit brighter down by the tail. So that's baby number seven. And here is baby number nine. So a lot less pattern, very different sort of color tone, more of like a, a maroon brown than sort of like a darker, uh, sort of like darker, real dark, ready black almost. So there's baby number, what am I on? There's baby number eight, and this one hasn't had its first shed. So switching colors quite dramatically. Here's baby number nine, a beautiful yellow one. Very low pattern compared to its sibling. So beautiful, very symmetrical head pattern, really, really pretty, you know. Typically yellows don't turn out the sort of standouts, although Mosaic, and I'll put a picture up now, he was a yellow neonate and that's uh, the snake a good friend of mine, Pedro, over in Portugal owns. A, a world famous green tree python breeder actually so really really beautiful beautiful color so i'm going to be interested i'm going to be interested to see how it develops and what color it ends up probably going to be green but we, we might see some nice blues in there because it's been proven that some yellow babies hold on to them blues and the father of this clutch has got a ton of blue and here is the final baby. This is baby number 10. It's the only baby and only green tree python that's ever bit me in the whole of my life, whether it was my own green tree pythons or holding somebody else's. It's the only baby that was fed. It's the only baby that seems to hate me, but I love it for all that. Now I'm being extra careful not to have my hands within striking distance and that's not because I'm scared, it's simply if this snake bites me, it's probably gonna hurt the snake more than me. When it latched onto me, I was fortunately had my hand in a fixed position and I didn't move a, a millimeter. And I did feel it, believe it or not. I actually said, ow, and I thought that was quite fair. It didn't hurt that much, it, not enough to say ow, but I said it out loud, <laughs> I had a little chuckle, and then I thought I can actually feel each tooth uh, you know, sinking into my skin, but it didn't draw any blood. The teeth was just deep enough to hit the sort of like nervous system in your fingers. And yeah, it didn't really hurt, but it made me laugh. And I love this baby all the more. Oh, it constantly, constantly, uh, hence why it's fed. So that's baby number 10. I should maybe call this one certain. Right guys, so just before I wrap this video up, I just want to show you the purchase. So I pinched this design from Specialty Enclosure Designs. I'm going to link that uh, website in the description box below and I'll display it on screen because I think it's only fair to give them credit for the perch idea. Now I've seen these perches on many American Green Tree Python videos and when I was, you know, close hatching them, I contacted my good friend Phil over at Royally Tempted because Phil is a professional 3D printer by trade. And I said, Phil, please, would you make me these perches? I bought the dowels offline, uh, black dowels. I said, would you print me these perches? Because I want to copy the ones of specialty enclosure designs. And we had, uh, you know, a good brainstorming chat and was going back and forth. And we decided to do a five mil perch. I think it was six mil, seven mil and eight mil. So the babies have got heat differences, perch size differences. So we're trying to give them, we're, we're trying to give them a clean, almost sterile environment, but still provide them with things they may need, like slightly different perch sizes. So they are, so it's not all the same. I don't believe Specialty Enclosure Designs does different perch sizes. So if you do go on to buy any from them, please don't think 
there's our five six and seven and eight because i really don't think they do so you know i don't want to put wrong information out there but these ones are and they're working fantastically well thanks once again to phil really love them uh really good this one's demon boy amazing so yeah really happy about them so they work fantastic and because of the way the 3d printing goes it gives a textured finish so i don't know if you can make that out but they're very textured so that will aid shedding etc so fantastic so big shout out to phil thanks once again mate really appreciate your hard work and i'm over the moon with the results so guys i hope you've enjoyed this video i'm sorry it was a very long one but there was a lot i had to talk about a lot i had to cover and talking green cheese i could do it all day long maybe not in front of a camera but i could do it all day long you know talking to another enthusiast so if you like the video guys please give it a thumbs up and maybe leave a comment of support and if you haven't give it two thumbs down and i'll catch you on the next one cheers guys